Hello everyone. Welcome to the 2021 CollegeNet User Conference. Hindsight is 2020. I'm Jill Thacker, Associate Vice President of Corporate Communications. Thank you so much for joining us. It's wonderful to be able to reconnect with everyone again, even though this virtual space is a far cry from the Portland Hilton Ballroom. Although, at least your coffee is probably a lot better, right? We have some great sessions lined up that you'll want to be sure to attend during our three days together. So I hope you've had a chance to check the conference schedule and plan your day. But don't worry, if you miss a session, it will be available later for playback. Our first presentations begin this morning at 1015 Pacific time. If you're following the Series 25 track, you'll want to head over to Jeff Sanders' presentation on the state of the Series 25 software. If you're following the admissions track, the next stop is Gracie Lundell's presentation on the CRM roadmap. Again, both sessions begin at 1015 Pacific time. You can find the links to those presentations in the chat area. Well, you should feel proud to know that you are among a record-breaking group. At last count, I saw that over twice as many folks are with us this year than in any previous year. So many, in fact, that we ran out of those nifty ID tags that everyone just loves to wear. Yeah, you knew something was missing, right? So, if you're feeling a little underdressed without that name tag dangling from that big blue lanyard around your neck, by all means, we encourage you to get creative, make your own, and display it proudly. Yes, things are different. And we've all gotten used to adjusting our expectations with respect to so many parts of our lives this past year and a half. But I think if we've learned anything during this time, it's that valuable human connections can still happen, even during socially distant times. Thanks, of course, to technology. And, of course, technology is the main reason we're gathered today. CollegeNet engineers and developers have been busy this past year, creating innovative systems and tools that will continue to keep you and your schools on the cutting edge of admissions, scheduling, event planning, and career services. We're excited to be telling you about those developments during our three days together. But, in addition to creating, We've also been listening, listening to your feedback and learning how your needs have changed in response to some very unexpected conditions on your campuses. Being nimble enough to innovate quickly and provide the personalized customer service you've needed to navigate extraordinary times is what we're most proud of. A lot of you have been telling us directly how our customer service is making it possible not only to continue doing the work you do, but to do it better. And it's been gratifying to read your emails. I have a few examples of those I'd like to share with you now. Brian Papa at Eastern Kentucky University wrote, even though we were all dealing with job-related restrictions due to COVID-19 and social distancing, not a single bit of the customer service experience had been lost while working together remotely. We fully attribute this to the excellent team at CollegeNet. Gellis Chasen at University of Miami wrote, Yesterday afternoon, I communicated with our scheduling team and our supervisor, letting them know how awesome you guys have been during this time of uncertainty. We appreciate the fast speed you guys have put into providing solutions to all your customers' scheduling needs. Jason Nichols at St. Joseph's College wrote, I just want to say how grateful we are for the superb job you've done in walking us through the entire planning and implementation. Your patience with us was unwavering, and your wisdom and insight were invaluable. It has been an absolute joy doing business with you. Ann Manning at Wellesley College wrote, I have not worked with a more thorough and knowledgeable team in my many years managing system implementations. Your documentation and project leadership were outstanding. And finally, Gina Odie at Oaks Christian School wrote, my goodness, 
I'm very impressed to receive this information so quickly. And to get an email on a Sunday evening, wow, talk about customer service. CollegeNet's culture of excellent customer service begins with the person at the top of our organization. And that person is our president, Jim Wolston. Today, the growing importance of customer service in our increasingly remote world is foremost in Jim's mind. CollegeNet's quality of service has not come about through some happy accident, empty corporate mission statement, marketing slogan, or splashy annual event. It has emerged deliberately by consistently selecting for a rare and special quality of mind in the professionals that CollegeNet employs. As we look back at the events of 2020, the growing political divide in our nation, and the growing gap between rich and poor around the world, it is Jim's conviction that if our higher education system and our culture can shift its emphasis and selection towards this rare quality of mind, not only will we produce more and better employment candidates for CollegeNet, we will produce even more of the innovations that can lead to a brighter future for higher education and our society. I know Jim is looking forward to sharing more on these thoughts with you today. So, without further ado, I am honored to present CollegeNet President Jim Woolston. Thanks, Jill, for your gracious introduction, and many thanks to all of you for attending this year's conference. There's a good chance you may know people who died or came close to death owing to COVID. Here in the U.S., we've suffered more deaths, 600,000, than during our nation's deadliest war, the Civil War, which killed 500,000 people. If you were personally hit by this tragedy, I extend my empathy. Both my sister and her husband were hospitalized with COVID last year. Jack ended up in intensive care. Although they both survived, Jack continues to suffer mysterious symptoms of what is now called long COVID. But you and I are among the lucky ones who can enjoy the sunshine and the birds on the summer day. This makes me particularly grateful for the chance to speak to you again here at our conference. As Jill's customer quotes affirm, despite the ongoing challenges of COVID, CollegeNet continues to provide outstanding customer service. And today I'm going to explain why. Because it turns out that the mindset and approach behind our customer service carries important insights that I believe we can apply towards creating a significantly improved higher education system and a better society. There is no doubt last year we were all pushed into a boundary condition where many things we once took for granted were turned upside down. The world we've, we've suddenly been forced into is newly awed. For example, we've quickly accepted the phrase social distancing, even though it's an oxymoron. Even walking into your local bank nowadays, you're liable to see strange new things you never saw before. Wait a minute, masks are required? Isn't a mask the apparel of choice for bank robbers? As this new normal developed, we also witnessed for the first time in our nation's history the ransacking of our nation's capital by our own citizens. Huh? How can this be? A government that purports to be of and by the people suddenly gets ransacked of and by its own people? So what, what can we make of this? What are the takeaways? Is there anything actionable we can pull from the experience of 2020 to make our higher education system better and improve our society? This goal, this responsibility is why I'm going to tell you more here about the mindset we select for at CollegeNet among our customer support professionals. I showed you earlier a picture of the Capitol riot. This event marks the first time in the history of our country where our own citizens invaded and ransacked the epicenter of our government. The key abstraction I want you to think about is that the citizens who were involved in this riot were absolutely sure they were right. But I also want you to think about the fact that the people who were appalled by all of this were also absolutely sure they were right. What does it mean to be absolutely right if it does not mean being close to the ideas of others and convinced of the absolute rectitude of your own position? 
One of the most poignant lines inscribed in the Lincoln Memorial is from Lincoln's second inaugural address in which he said about the soldiers on both sides of the Civil War battlefield, quote, both read the same Bible and pray to the same God and each invokes his aid against the other. Indeed, pictures from the Civil War era depict battlefields littered with bodies and pocket Bibles on both sides. Both sides thought that they were right and that they possessed the absolute truth. As good as citizens in our increasingly polarized society, we need to be aware of and rethink the forces that ossify our ideas and our points of view. Over the past 20 years, we have been witnessing a sea change in the technology of media that is increasingly driving mental ossification and polarization in our society. Today, the new media algorithms designed to maximize clicks and ad views work because they detect individual tastes and deliver information consistent with those tastes. The new media algorithms drive sales, but they also drive confirmation bias on a grand scale. It is now easier than ever to find people who agree with you no matter what your point of view happens to be. All you have to do is wait and the new media will feed you stories and news, quote unquote, that help assure you that everyone else agrees with what you already tend to believe. Over the past 20 years, we've had a big shift that's occurred in terms of the media. Before 2000, we had a, a system where potential stories, potential news that we would receive was before it was given to us, was given to journalists and editors. Most of the time, these people were trained, at journalists and editors, and they were trained through higher education to look for objective truth, to look for that which was verifiable or supportable. There was a high, high premium on journalistic excellence. And those journalists and editors, highly trained, were a kind of filtration mechanism through which potential stories passed into the newspaper or the television program that we would watch. And subscribers would choose which newspaper to read quite often because of its journalistic excellence, its various awards, its awards for objectivity. But here's what's interesting about that old model is that every one of us who subscribed to say the Washington Post got the same newspaper. And as a consequence, every one of us was looking at a consistent corpus of information. And every one of us, since there's variety within a given newspaper, had the potential to be exposed to ideas that weren't necessarily part of the way we looked at the world. We weren't making the choice that on the second page of the Washington Post on a given issue, uh, we weren't making the choice that there was a story about gardening. Well, if I'm not a gardener, uh, I have the opportunity to collide to that with that story. And if I'm sitting there on the airplane, maybe I read about gardening. And because of the way the story is written, I discover a new potential hobby. I discover something that's, that I didn't know much about before. There is far more potential under the old media model since everybody was getting a large variety of curated information for any given individual to encounter ideas, hobbies, experiences, points of view that didn't necessarily line up with what they were believing or subscribing to or involved in. That's the way the media system was set up before the advent of the internet. Now look at this next slide. We have something that's vastly different. We have a system in which anything goes. There's no filter. <laughs> All stories, no matter how dubious, no, how, no matter how conspiratorial, no matter how anti-scientific, no matter how scientific, are up for grabs. And the filter is no longer a filter. The filter is a matching and sorting algorithm by the big data companies that tries to match to the ideas 
and the points of view and the hobbies that you're already involved in. It's more likely that you're going to comfortably click on an ad for a gardening tool if you're already a gardener. And so your feed, your news feed, is going to be more of a reflective of what the algorithms have determined to be your proclivities, your interests, your point of view. This is a very, very powerful ossifying force on information that unfortunately works alongside the old reliance that we still have in higher education on testing for and using facile knowledge as the currency of worthiness for attending institutions of higher education. Prior to 1987, there was something called the Fairness Doctrine. So any given channel, any given newspaper, any given news pro program had to present contradictory points of view. It required contrasting viewpoints. But that was thrown out after 1987. It was thrown out because all of a sudden you could end up with a potpourri of different channels, some of which were highly narrow and focused on a particular point of view, political or otherwise. And so free choice reigned. And of course, people, just as they reach for a beer in the fridge, are going to reach for a news program that satisfies their own personal and confirms their own personal biases and their own personal preconceptions. Again, ossifying knowledge, ossifying information to the detriment of our ability as a, as a society to pivot. But also ingraining the, the, the surety that we have with respect to our own ideas and hence the polarization that's occurred in our society. Consider the source we used to be told, and that was when there were gatekeepers in the form of trained journalists who were taught to select for and write about objective truth, and when there was aspiration on the part of publications to deliver on that imperative and win recognition for their objective reporting. Magazines and newspapers would compete for and trumpet their various journalistic awards in order to win subscribers. The source of money was straightforward, newsstand sales, subscriptions, and advertising revenue. Now the game is different. Attract eyeballs, drop cookies on individual computers, call subscription sign-up information and take surveys, and then sell all that information to the algorithms. Thus the primary source for what you read and consume is no longer the general news publications you select. It is the algorithm that seeks to discern what you already like and then serve up articles and information consistent and supportive of those biases. Under such comfortable confirmation, you are more likely to stay on a page, read the ad, and click through. The algorithm is the source, and the algorithms comfort, reinforce, and thus ossify what you already think. This is the opposite of the dynamic at CollegeNet and the kind of people we seek to employ. The CollegeNet customer service ethos starts with the conviction that what every one of us does here at CollegeNet and what every one of you does at your campus matters in a big way to the outcome for our society and our species. If you've watched our new award-winning documentary, Rigged, you'll understand that we're all now living in the learning age. The ticket to opportunity in this new learning age is no longer access to land as it once was back in the homesteading era, or access to factory jobs as it was during the industrial era, or even access to knowledge back in the knowledge era. It is access to higher education. The, most, uh, the importance of higher education in this new age is, is, is that it is in the best position to gestate the most important and rare kind of thinking, what I call advanced critical thinking. Advanced critical thinking is the ability to look at all ideas, including all of your own ideas, without exception, with skepticism and detachment. You can think of CollegeNet in a cellular metaphor. CollegeNet's customer service team constitutes the membrane or cell wall through which information from the company passes to you and through which we receive information regarding your needs and your use of our product. While the cell wall shows our customer service team at the interface of the communications between our company and you, 
The communications often involve us thinking about and absorbing information from you regarding the boundary conditions of our products. Thus, the metaphor of boundary carries two important meanings here. It's the periphery of our company and the connection to our customers, but it's also dealing in the critical information that more fully informs and instructs us about the limitations of our products and services, i.e. the boundary conditions for our software. Now, none of these is a nice condition. We'd like every one of our customers to instantly be able to perform all tasks better and faster using our products. One of the key responsibilities every one of our great programmers takes very seriously is attempting to imagine and test for all boundary conditions. You can't make it here as a programmer without that commitment to rigor. It is certainly our job as technologists to write our code and our documentation with the fullest possible understanding and to, and to disclose its boundary conditions to you as fully as we know them. But the reality is that no technology innovator operates with omniscience. We know that eventually, one of you is liable to do something new with our software, something that we did not expect. Our acute awareness of this possibility forms the second prong of our customer service ethos. We anticipate that something could go wrong or that something we write or say about our products might be misunderstood. But we actually go further in that we appreciate the chance to encounter these kinds of limitations because they can provide the clearest pathway towards understanding how our products can be expanded or improved. Customer service is thus an essential component in the CollegeNet innovation feedback loop. To perform this part of the loop in a world-class manner, it is necessary to select for people who are comfortable at the limits of capability, at the limits of our documentation and teaching, and who are ready and interested in making discoveries about how these limits can be better understood, expanded, and improved. The world of communications at the customer service boundary is one that cannot be fully governed by facile or automatic knowledge. Quick answers may be available, and that is always good, but what is most important in the mind of customer service professionals here is the enthusiasm and capacity to go deeper towards understanding. Going deeper into the understanding of things is also the nature of debugging. To welcome the chance to see things you didn't expect and then deal with them. Very importantly, this mindset is fundamental to innovation. If you are truly innovating, you are rethinking what is taken for granted and thereby jumping into the uncharted. And so you must be ready to deal with the unknown, unfamiliar, and unexpected. Our customer service team is thus an extension of our ability to innovate. Now, if we look at this more formally, we can look at what I'm calling the innovation cube. This defines the mindset we select for in both our customer service professionals and our programmers. And this first vector here is what we call facile knowledge. The importance of facile knowledge is, 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 is that it enables us to do complicated things like drive a car or give a speech or tie our shoelaces for that matter. Uh, we count on facile knowledge when we fly in an airplane. We're hoping that the pilot has lots of experience and he or she can carry out the fl flight plan safely. So let's suppose that we're taking an SAT test because an SAT test or a GRE test or an LSAT test are tests of facile knowledge. There's a certain window, maybe one hour, during which you have to get as many answers right as you possibly can. And so let's, let's go through uh, an example question. Let's pick a question, though, that's easy. And if we can, through our automatic knowledge, answer this question quickly, we can get on to the tougher questions that the test presents. So here's the question. You tell me, what's two plus two? Well, if you said four, you're right, and we can go on to the next question. But wait a minute. There's something deeper behind even something as simple as two plus two. Because 2 plus 2 depends on a context. It depends upon the idea that we're operating in the base 10 system. 
And of course we've operated in this since the earliest times of humanity because most of us have 10 fingers. But what would happen if we had evolved as a species such that each hand had only two fingers? If we, were, we would be likely operating in base four. Very interestingly, in base four, two plus two is equal to 10, not four. And so you can see that the truth of a statement, the truth of a statement depends upon the context in which that statement operates, the context in which that idea operates. And that instructs us more with respect to the innovation cue, this vector that we call facile knowledge. That the facile knowledge isn't really enough, especially for something uh, that we call higher education. It's important also to approach the piece of knowledge or piece of information with detachment, our willingness to sacrifice that piece of knowledge if the context shifts or if it's later proven that that idea we took for granted no longer works in our family, in our society, in our higher education system. Another important aspect that's left out of the SAT tests and the ACT tests is the important vector, this very important vector of derivation. How did we get to this knowledge? How did we get to this idea that two plus two is equal to four? To the extent that we can explain this, to the extent that we can know this, and to the extent that we can know that there are other pathways to this same knowledge, is the extent to which we can explain it to others, the extent to which we can teach it to others. But there's also a very important downside. There's a very important caution with respect to facile knowledge, as useful and important as it is. And that is that it happens only because it is burnt into our cortex. It's built into our cortex as neuronal connections. And the more we practice, the more permanent that information becomes. People often say practice makes perfect. No, 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 no. Practice makes permanent. And that ossification can be a big danger if the context shifts, if the utility of that information, the usefulness of that information, starts to deteriorate owing to changes in the world. The extent to which knowledge is ingrained is the extent to which it cannot be easily changed. And this is dangerous in a fast-moving, fast-changing society. It is especially damaging and preclusive to innovation. And the long-held assumption that facile knowledge is the primary basis for evaluating people for college admissions with little or no attention paid to the other two critical vectors, the vector of detachment, the vector of derivation, is an atavism that harkens to a world in which knowledge was assumed to be accretive. Now there's a very interesting book that we are still talking about 50 years later. It was written by a philosopher of science named Thomas Kuhn. He wrote this book called Scient Structure of Scientific Revolutions you're probably familiar with this, this phrase, the paradigm shift. People have talked quite often about paradigm shifts. That actually came out of Thomas Kuhn's work. Thomas Kuhn said that, no, 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 science is not an activity of accretion. It's not a, an activity where we just keep adding truths to a bigger and bigger pile. No, in fact, what we have is a theory that looks at those statements and looks at the data that we've collected to that point. And always there are exceptions, there are boundary conditions to that theory that make that theory mostly true, but not always true. But the next breakthrough, the next shift, the next move in science quite often happens in a jump, a jump, a paradigm shift to a new theory, a new way of looking at the world. So those boundary conditions, just as they do in CollegeNet's customer service, contain the nuggets of improvement, the nuggets of shift, the opportunities to advance. I think this concept was best articulated by Nobel laureate Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman was a scientist, one of the scientists, who was brought on after the Challenger disaster to try to do the forensics on what eventually occurred or what caused that tragic accident. And he and his fellow investigators realized that it was a couple of what were called O-rings that failed. There were gaskets that 
that leaked and eventually caused the explosion, the tragic explosion. But here's what Feynman said about science itself. He said, scientific knowledge is a body of statements of varying degrees of certainty, some most unsure, some nearly sure, but none absolutely certain. And that captures the important wisdom about facile knowledge and its limitations, and the reason why we need to look at other vectors of knowledge that are associated with facile knowledge, including our level of detachment, our willingness to give it up, and our ability to derive that knowledge and understand its foundations. And so if we look at the way we now deal with this innovation cube in our higher education system, it's primarily along only one vector, the vector of facile knowledge. We set up this race that's an hour, an hour and a half, two hours of a standardized test in which you're to guess or to give the quote unquote right answer. And whoever races the fastest with the most facile knowledge is thereby presumed to be the person or persons who are most eligible, most capable, most advanced, and most worthy for higher education. This is a fundamental mistake that we are making. It's an atavism, it's a throwback to the knowledge era. In a fast changing world, it's becoming more and more important for us as people, as a society, to be willing to be detached from our ideas when they no longer work. And it's also important for us to be able to replicate what works faster and faster by virtue of our capacity to derive it, to understand its origins, and to understand other pathways that we can use as explanations to others as to how our knowledge came about. You can get to those kinds of questions by asking people, how did you come to believe this? You can also get to the detachment vector by asking an individual to what extent, what are the conditions under which the, the idea that you have, uh, what are the conditions, what's the context in which the idea you're expressing might not be true. You can now start to probe for these important vectors just as we do at CollegeNet, just as we do for our customer support professionals, just as we do for our programmers, in the interest of innovation, in the interest of being able to pivot as a corporation to this fast-changing world. Our fundamental requirement and need for the highest possible performance, the kind of performance that we deliver in our customer service, is married up, not just to facile knowledge, but to the capacity, this vector of derivation, the ability to derive, the ability to explain how information is derived, and further, a detachment to any corpus of knowledge so that it can be discarded or replaced or improved more readily. As a substitute for critical thinking, the new media is a deteriorating force in our society that higher education should be taking the lead in resisting. But instead, we're doing just the opposite in our admissions practices. Just as higher education now cravenly caters to the popular notion that richer schools are better schools as enshrined in the U.S. News rankings, we're also continuing to tag along with the popular but antiquated notion that the most elevated knowledge is that which is most facile, glib, ingrained, and quickly delivered. For the good of our society, for the good of the practice of science, for the good of the art of teaching, for the good of the practice of law, higher education needs to overthrow the assumption that facile knowledge is the primary basis for academic worthiness. Blindly accepting facile knowledge as the primary basis for college admissions is backwards. It contributes to the ossification of ideas, the surety of people's convictions, and thus contributes to the polarization and strife in our society. Higher education needs to be higher, and higher means paying attention to rewarding and developing not only facile knowledge, but these other two far more important vectors in the innovation mindset. 
These are the vectors that ask the questions such as, where did my ideas come from? And under what circumstances do my ideas no longer work? None of the testing companies can provide these tools to you. They are the edifices that seek to preserve their position and wealth while perpetuating popular tastes that overvalue facile knowledge. They are blind and resistant to the chances for revolution and innovation. I get to see and hear some things that you don't, being president of CollegeNet. I once asked the president of one of the major testing agencies, hey, why do you charge kids $15 to just send a score? His answer to me as he smiled and winked, quote, because while we're a non-for-profit, we're also not for loss either. The great thing is that CollegeNet now has new and patented technologies under standout asynchronous video that can help you break out of the box, that overvalues facile knowledge, and instead test at scale for the two far more important vectors, idea detachment and derivation, the vectors that feed learning and innovation. As this slide depicts, our admission system is now testing for only one dimension, the dimension of facile knowledge. The higher the facile knowledge, the more worthy the candidate for admissions. What we need to do instead is to move the selection criteria into three dimensions. We need to move the balls that are now stuck in the lower right front face of this cube higher and deeper in order to capture the much more powerful dimensions of thought, open-mindedness, and capacity for derivation, the dimensions of thought behind innovation. We are inviting you who are in college admissions to rethink, adapt, and experiment with us. Let's lead and inspire society, not just tag along with popular but wrong-headed notions of what is good and right. I told you this story about my sister Louise and my brother-in-law Jack and their, their battle with COVID. Well, shortly after Louise got out of the hospital, my mother died. And my mother knew about a hobby that I had, which was to send her from time to time pieces of classical music that I really enjoyed. And I looked for these recordings. It's interesting that with pop music, you're never going to get anybody that plays uh, uh, thriller better than Michael Jackson or, or um, Luke and Back Texas better than w w Willie and Waylon. Those original pop pieces we w are, are really hard for any kind of garage band to duplicate. But the thing about classical music is that on many of the compositions we don't know how they were originally played by the great artists who originated them. So today on any given classical music piece, especially for piano or guitar, you can actually find renditions from unknown people that are just as good as anything that's available on the internet. And so from time to time I have this kind of hobby where I look for a really beautiful recording and I send it to my, my I used to send it to my mom. So my sister Louise took on the task of putting together the service, the memorial service for my mother and she asked me, she said, Jim, maybe what you could do is pick out one of those pieces that you think might be appropriate for uh, honoring and tri paying tribute to mom. And so when I did my research, I, I found out that Chopin had actually written a prelude. It's Opus 28, number four. And he wrote that prelude as something he said he wanted to have played at his own funeral. So I figured, hey, if it was good enough for Chopin, it certainly would be good enough for mom. And my sister agreed when she heard it and agreed to include it. And it was a recording from an unknown person, uh, but I think it was appropriately sparse and it was appropriately solemn. Uh, and I think it's worth sharing with you here. But I'm sharing it with you not because I think we ought to regret what happened last year, 2020, but I'm sharing it with you to think about if you've lost a loved, a loved one, not just that you've lost that person, but about what you can do, what you can do with that tragedy, how you can take the results of that experience and convert them into something that's sweet and good for your family, for higher education, or for our society. 
Thank you very much for listening.